Hello, welcome to New Harvest Christian Fellowship, Manchester, England, and thank you for subscribing to our sermon podcast. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. We pray it will be a blessing to your life, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'll give you our contact information at the end of the recording. Thank you once again. Enjoy the preaching. Into the book of Ephesians. If you remember last week, we talked about the strength of Samson and uh, uh, our plan. I say our because uh, I, I could say my plan, but I hope that my plan is not just my plan. I hope that my prayer and seeking God uh, is, uh, makes it mine and God's plan. <laughs> that's, my, that's why I say our. I use the plural. Uh, our plan was to continue on with this issue of Samson, this person of Samson. As a matter of fact, uh, the message that I had was uh, the overpowering influence of self-deception, because that's an important one to know. Uh, but in saying that, I can't get Ephesians out of my head. And it's just been there uh, lingering here, so I'm just going to preach it. You decide if I should have stuck with the original plan or not, but uh, I pray that there's at least one person that God speaks to through this message here tonight. Uh, If there is, then uh, I'll have done the right thing. Amen. The title of our message is Affiliations, Associations, and Alliances. Uh, if you want to, if you use the U version Bible program, you can go to the uh, events page on there if your GPS is turned on and have a look at that and write some notes there. Uh, the passages that we'll be looking at is Ephesians 5, it's 22 through uh, chapter 6, verse 9. Uh, we're not going to read the whole passage, we're going to do a flyover of the entire. Uh, passage here to be able to grasp some things. And what I want to grasp and what's in my heart, and I've said this lots of times, I know, is this issue of relationships. Because I've, one thing I, I know is that all of the uh, crash and burns that I've seen in Christianity Crash and Burns comes from a thing years ago. There was a magazine called Hot Rod Magazine, and uh, they had all of the hot rod cars, the big muscle American cars that were there, and they had a section in the back called Crash and Burns, and that's where there was these massive wrecks, and everybody would get the new uh, uh, week's uh, magazine and turn to the back to see the Crash and Burns. Unfortunately, I've seen Christians' lives crash and burn. I've seen churches crash and burn. Fortunately, I've seen them crash and burn and rise from the ashes again as well. That's good news. But almost all of the crash and burns have some sort of connection to this issue of relationships. They weren't done properly or they were ignored or uh, they just weren't even, uh, they were just ignored. And so I want to look with you tonight at Ephesians chapter 5. And look at with you some of these affiliations, associations, and alliances. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. We can start there for just a minute. I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation. If you can turn to that one, you can do it. If not, just follow along. In your version, Ephesians 5.22 says, For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body, of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean and washed by the cleansing of God's word. If we can just kind of skip down to verse 28, please, for the sake of time. 
In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own body. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. You should get that, guys. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scripture says, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So I say again, so again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Pray with me today. Heavenly Father, I ask, Lord God, that you would help us and that you would open our hearts. And God, that I would be able to be concise and be able to bring forth your thoughts and your truths tonight that people would receive. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to probe initially with you this relationship of husband and wife. I recognize that not all of you are married here today, but most of you will want to be married, uh, and uh, it might take you a while, and the way you've been acting, it might take you even longer. You didn't catch that one. I, I just like threw that right out at you there. But the truth is, is, is see, sometimes this is what people do, single people, people who are not yet married. They think they're waiting for the right one to show up in their church. And God's saying, I'm waiting for you to change in order to bring this person. Because I'm bringing him or her in until. That's a whole issue in and of itself. But my point is, is that this issue of husband and wife is an important one. No other relationship can start off so fierce, so passionate, uh, and end up so divided and so indifferent and so dull. I have a little illustration. We're just going to cover this briefly, but if you just click to the next slide, you'll be able to see uh, this. This is our idea, and this is how it starts off. At some point in your marriage, at some point in every relationship, this is how it is. You have in your heart, you're connected, you're close, you feel one another, you, you love them. Even if you have a little fight or a little tiff, it's no big deal because the relationship is fierce. But then it doesn't take very long before it goes to the next slide. And before you know it, the very same people that started off so passionate, so fierce, uh, end up being so divided and so indifferent. And that is such a sad, sad thing. It doesn't need to be like that. This relationship, above all other relationships, needs constant care and nurturing. But you don't notice that right in the beginning. In the beginning, it seems so natural. You just feel, it's like you're instantly one. You feel this chemistry, as we say, because there's a connection there. And you're feeling this thing, but before long, the chemistry seems to go. People start using terms like, I've fallen out of love. They start looking back as if they have perfect hindsight now and say, why did I even get married, and the problem is, is that they just didn't recognize that this relationship needs constant care and constant nurturing. If I had a hot house, I think that's what you call them, those glass structures that you grow plants in. If I had a hot house, I would grow chili plants because, one, I like hot chilies, but, one, I'm fascinated with the way that they grow, and I'm not much into gardening. I like working with my hands, and I don't mind gardening, but uh, chili plants really kind of excite me, and I've grown a few in my time, and there's a chili plant that has cayenne peppers. You can, you buy it in your shop, you know, they have cayenne pepper, uh, and you can buy, make, plant these chilies, and they'll just grow like mad. If you have a hot enough hot house, and you water them enough, they'll just grow like mad, and you'll have chilies every year, and if you let that bush grow big and just trim it a little bit, that thing will just produce red chilies like crazy. Some of you have seen those, uh, you know, those dried chili uh, ristras, they're called, you know, with a bunch of dried chilies. The cayenne is the one that they use. On the other hand, there's a, a chili that all of us chili heads love. It's uh, here in England, they call it the Scotch bonnet. 
It's a hot one, and we love it, and it's good for those that like hot ones, but that is a lot more difficult to grow. It takes a lot of care and nurture, especially if you want it to produce hot chilies. Marriage is like growing scotch bonnets. You need to spend a lot of time and care and in nurturing, and many people don't understand that. If you read this passage that we just read today, you read it again, you can find that it's pretty much summarized in verse 33. It's summed up in two words, love and respect. Love and respect. So important. There's a good book by that title. I can give you the author. I forget his name now, but very good book to read. Talks much about this issue but just in general, love and respect. Now, both partners need love and respect. Men need love. Women need respect. Men need respect. Women need love. But they don't need it in equal doses. It's just a a fact of life that women need love more than they need respect, and men need respect more than they need love. We need both. But men need to be respected, and women need to be loved. And so for The fact that we're not going to spend a lot of time, this is not a marriage class, and I've got other things that I need to talk with you about this evening. I'm just going to tell you that there are certain things, brother, that you have to love about your wife. And if you want to get married someday, you're going to have to learn to love that woman more than anyone else on the planet, not have more passion for her than anyone else on the planet. That's important, but that's only one ingredient. I'm talking about learning to love her more than anyone else on the planet. And ladies, if you're going to get married, you're going to have to learn to respect your husband more than any other male you've ever met, including your dad. (laughs) I told my youngest daughter that. I don't think she believes me, but it's true. You're going to have to respect him more than you respect even the man that you've respected your whole life. What is it that you're going to have to love about her, brother? Let me start off by saying you need to love her way. You need to love her way. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 30, that the Proverbs, the writer of Proverbs is saying there are three things too wonderful. No, four things that are too wonderful for me. And in verse 19, he makes this statement. The fourth thing that's too wonderful for him is the way of a man with a woman. He loves the way of that woman. Do you love her way? Not her ways, but who she is and how she is and carries herself. And that's something that you develop. You start off by being attracted by beauty. You might then initially be attracted uh, attracted by beauty and then move to personality. But there's something about loving their way that's so important. If you're listening by podcast, I want to tell you, You need to learn to love her way, young man. Love her way. You need to also love her work. Ladies, you should be a worker. Not have a job, but be a worker. Having a job, (laughs) some of you go to work every day and don't work. Some of you show up at a job every day but don't work. (laughs) I'm talking about more than just showing up at a job. I'm talking about working. It's an important thing. The Bible talks about in the Proverbs 31, uh, uh, in Proverbs 31, and starting at verse 10 and all the way down through the end of the chapter. I know all of the ladies in here have read it several dozen times and heard thousands of teachings on it. But one of the things you notice right off is that this woman, this model of, a, of being a, a, a picture of what a woman should be like, you realize once she's married, she has a family and she works hard. She's a hard worker. The Bible says in Proverbs 31, verse 28, her children stand and bless her, and her husband praises her. Why does he praise her? Because he admires her work ethic. You need to love her work. You need to thank her for her work. You need to acknowledge her work. You need to look at her work and say, you know what, I love that about you. I see how you do this. That's important if this relationship is ever going to be what God intended it to be. Ladies, you're going to have to respect your husband. Respect. This is a funny thing men have, is this issue of respect. 
We, we often feel like when someone treats us badly that they're disrespecting us. This is, seems to be something that comes out of our mouth often because we feel slighted, we feel hurt. Sometimes it's just our feelings are hurt, but we say we're disrespected. Respect is important. How do you respect your husband? One, you respect his time. You understand his time. You understand that he operates by a certain time frame. Most husbands, not all, but most husbands are usually more punctual than their wives. Not all, but majority are. Respect that in him. Respect his time, the things that he's doing. Respect his time he goes to work. All of the things he does. Men want to be known for their time. Respect your husband's time. Respect his space. His space. Sometimes men don't know how to verbalize the things that are going on. See, that's one of the problems with Gracie and I is that I'm a preacher. I, I, I put words together for a living so I can talk for hours about things, man, and I can use words from here and there and put them together, and sometimes it's like too many words. <laughs> but the reality is for most men, they struggle with this, and sometimes they need space to get their head together. I know men can be ridiculous on this point, but at the same time, ladies, you respect his space. Give him some room to sort it out in his head. You also need to respect his decisions. Respect his decisions. I know this may be difficult, especially if you feel like you're more intelligent than him, especially if you feel like you're wiser than him. That may or may not be true. You may be wiser than him. You may be more intelligent. But then again, you may just be full of yourself. True? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. One lady in the house said amen. The rest are like, I hate this guy. I wish he'd move on. Respect his decisions, his time, his space, and his decisions. There's lots that we could talk about, but again, we're doing this flyover of our affiliations, associations, and alliances. The next one we want to look at is Ephesians chapter 6. Can you turn there with me, please? Ephesians chapter 6. So the first relationship was husband and wives. This next one is going to be found in this passage. It's children and parents. Notice that sometimes the, the Bible, just I want you to catch this, is that, you know, when we versified the Bible, not we, but humankind versified the Bible for easy uh, uh, looking up and all of that, sometimes we uh, just pick the best spot that they thought for cutting chapters and verses, but sometimes it, it like, kind of puts a divide where there is no divide, and this is one of those cases, is that the end of chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6 isn't the start of a new thought. They ought to just be mished, mashed together. Not mishmash, but mashed together. And the book of Ephesians chapter 6, English Standard Version, verse 1, says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Every parent would say that's true, Right? And this means, just before we read the rest of it, in order to be a good parent, you should be enforcing this, right? Now, how you enforce it, that's up to a matter of debate, and I know that you both have to come to a conclusion of how you're going to do it, but at some point, you're going to have to say, what are the rules, what are the codes of conduct for our home? You know, it was a while back that Gracie and I went to the Trafford Center, and as we were walking into the Trafford Center from place where we parked our car, right on the side, no one notices it, no one goes and checks it out, of course I do because I'm weird, is I go up there and there's a thing that says code of conduct. Did you know that there's a code of conduct for the Trafford Center? No, you didn't. You just go in there and do whatever. That's how it is with our homes sometimes. There should be a code of conduct. I know no one thinks that there should be, but there should, be, or doesn't act as if there is one, but there should be. There's a code of conduct. And as parents, you enforce that. I know you can't force your kids, especially as they get older, especially as they move into adulthood. I mean, in this country, when you're 16 to 18, you know, you're considered an adult, different depending on the issue. 
But the reality is kids become adults around 13. They start getting that adult mindset, that adult attitude, some even a little bit younger than that. So once they start getting to that point, I know it's difficult to enforce, but nevertheless, if your relationship in your home is going to be right, because one of the crash and burns that I've seen is older parents looking back and feeling like, look it, man, I served God all these years, and look what I've got. Look what's happened. And now, and they feel like God's just left them. God didn't leave them. It's just when they were two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you weren't doing this. And you need to work on this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. I don't know if there's an age limit. I don't know if you age out on this, uh, people. I think that as you get older, you still obey your parents. You still, you know, I, I visited my mother. I hadn't seen her for a number of years. I visited my mother the last time we were back in the U.S. And, uh, you know, I still do what she says, you know. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm an old man. I still do what my mother tells me to do. Even my own son, you know, he's got his own family and he's grown up, but he goes, man, I still fear you, Dad. I'm still afraid of you, Dad, you know. And uh, I, I think it's not so much fear. It's just a reverence, you know. And so I don't think you ever age out on this. And then it says, honor your father, father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but honor them, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The key word is what you see on your slide today. It's a key word of honor. It's something that should be established in the home. Young kids should get this, but how can young kids honor their parents if their parents have not taught them honor, if they have not demonstrated honorable lives? See, this is so critical. This is so important. When they're real small, it's basically just caring for them, taking care of them. (laughs) But when they get older, they need more demonstration of this. Honoring your father and mother as being respectful in word and in action and having an inward attitude of esteem for their position. It means that you have an attitude that says, I respect them in word and in action. And that's why Parents of younger children should never allow their younger children. I know we don't have many here tonight, but maybe they're listening by podcast. The truth is, is that you have to instill that them. You cannot talk to me like that. You cannot talk to any adults like that. You do not speak to parents or, or uh, adults in that manner. And I understand adults have responsibility to treat all of your kids with respect. But if you start teaching your kids that every time an adult reprimands them that you're going to step in for them, boy, what you're doing is just giving them license to disrespect any adult that they find, any adult they disagree with, and guess what? They'll disagree with you pretty soon because eventually it will be you in the hot seat, not the teacher at the school or the security guard at the local mall. Honor them, and you esteem them for their position. See, honor is more than just giving respect for merit, for the things that they do good, they do things that they do well. You give respect to them even for their position. Because sometimes mothers and sometimes fathers didn't do very well in parenting. But yet they still deserve an element of respect simply because of their position. I've always said this about politics, and I don't want to get into politics tonight, but you honor who's ever in that job, that top job. You may not agree with them. You may even think that the person in that job, how did they even get there? There are many people in the U.S. who feel like that now. And regardless of how you feel, that's their position. You can disagree. You can fight against them. Our systems of government in the West allow for that. We can do that, but you respect them. Your children should be able to come to you and express their feelings Your children should be able to say things to you, to be able to bring their point of view across. But at the end of the day, it should be an attitude of respect based on your rank, 
based on who you are. And if that's not occurring, then it's up to every parent in order to deal with that. And again, I recognize we have very few of them here tonight, but again, maybe someone will be listening that this will apply to. See, and let me say this to all parents, is that you might deserve honor for your rank, but it cannot be demanded for your merit. You might think that you deserve it, but it must be earned, and it usually needs to be earned over a lifetime. It's so easy to lose respect. It's so easy for them to remove their honor, but it takes so long to gain it. For those of you that are not married, that are planning on getting married, planning on raising families, let me tell you, you should go into that with the utmost gravity in your heart because the job that you're wanting is not one that you see on television. It's one that requires lots of thought, lots of heart, lots of investment of time and effort. It will cost you your life to raise a family. Honor that is given under compulsion that if someone forces them to honor them, ceases to be honor. It is no longer honor. It is merely an act, an outward show for the benefit of people, sometimes just the one person. Yes, Father, yes, Father, I honor you. Yes, Father, yes, yes, Mother. But as soon as they get away from you, that blankety blank, blah, blah, blah. That's not what you want. Children and parents is important. Let's move on. Book of Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 5. I really just want to say to all fathers is that you should read verse 4 because, and try to get that in your heart because we are mothers, even the meanest mom alive, even the meanest mother on the planet still has this ability to comfort and nurture and soothe. But every father, no matter how meek and how mild he is, we can provoke. And so you should take some time to think about that. I'm not going to preach about it. I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, says, Slaves, another translation says, Bond servants, obey your masters here on earth. Respect them and honor them with a heart that is true. Obey them just as you would obey Christ. Don't obey them only to please them when they are watching. Do it because you are slaves of Christ. Be sure your heart does what God wants. We've talked about this word bondservant before. It's a word that in some instances can mean a person who voluntarily serves. It can mean that. But on the other hand, it can also mean a person who is in a position of permanent servitude, that they are forced into slavery, that they are now in a place where they have no say, no choice. Uh, And we all have heard about slavery. The country in which Gracie and I were born had massive movement of anti-slavery and the big battles were waged over that. That is the kind of slave that is being talked about here. Not a voluntary slave, but one who is forced into slavery. (laughs) Think about that for a minute before we get into it. Here you are being oppressed by another human being. Slavery is one of the most vile acts that you can imagine on the planet ever to occur, even though not not in every case was this a horrific case. Some slave owners were actually quite benevolent, and some of the, those that were indentured servants actually wanted to stay with them. But regardless of how it was, it just never should be like that for a human being, should it? We all know that to be true. So what I want to look at is some attitudes towards our oppressors, because I think that's what the Scripture is trying to give us here, some attitudes Let me first point this out, that the passage isn't approving of slavery. It's not saying slavery is a good thing or something that should be acceptable, but it deals with the reality of it. And you know, honestly, we all understand this to be true. We all deal with 
injustices, uh, obviously not as bad as this, but some sort of injustices all the time. You know it shouldn't be that way. Bad behaviors, bad behaviors exist. You know it shouldn't be that way. We don't approve of it, but we have to live with it. We have to work within this, whether we like it or not. It reminds me of the serenity prayer. Many of you have probably heard it. I'll read it for you again. It says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. That's so true when it comes to things like we're reading about here. If we could change slavery, then that should be our our mode of operation. That should be our attitude and our mindset. But if we're in a situation that that's not possible, then Lord, help me to accept the things I cannot change and to live accordingly. Slavery was so ingrained in the Roman culture at the time that Paul was writing to the Ephesians. And many, it was so ingrained that many Christians were now under the bondage of the Roman oppressors. It was a common thing to happen. And because Christians were with slaves, they were preaching to other slaves, and some of those slaves were getting saved. And they, things were happening. There was revival in slavery but they were still under the bondage of the oppressed or the oppressors in this terrible situation. So what do we do? What do we do? So let's just look quickly at the priorities of the oppressed. The priorities. Because that's what it comes down to, right? No one is saying the situation is right. But what do we do if we're in that situation? And and this is important for you because you're going to get in circumstances and situations in your life that are not right. Things that should not be that way. It shouldn't become like this. Your marriage may be not, this is not the perfect marriage. This is not one we put on the Disney Channel, you know. It's not like that. But on the other hand, it is a marriage that God ordains. It's God's plan. You have to do it God's way. And so you can look at some of these statements that are made to slaves, how they act towards masters for your own situation. First, it tells them to respect and honor and obey them. (laughs) Think about that for a minute. Here you got a guy ruling over, probably illegally, over another human being, and the Bible is saying to this human being that's being oppressed, respect, honor, and obey them. Almost doesn't seem right, does it? almost seems just plain wrong when you look at it. But the reason and what gets us and what gives us understanding is because Paul tells us why we do it. He says, respect, honor, and obey your masters because you are not only slaves of man, but you are slaves of Christ. And because you're a slave of Christ, you're going to act properly, even though the situation you're in is wrong. That's an important concept. So I've seen so many people that have bailed out on their Christian walk because their situation was not fair. That's unfortunate. I wish I could, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a father, you know, and I, I want to make everything right all the time. I want to fix everything, you know. I want to work out every injustice in the church as a pastor. Every time there's conflict between people, I want to, like, sort it out. But the reality is I can't. Reality is you can't. Reality is there are situations in life that should not be that way, but they are. How you act and how you respond matters. Because you're slaves of Christ. Be sure your heart does what God wants. It doesn't say get upset because it's not the way it should be and fight until it changes. I mean, that may be your your mandate. But even if that's your mandate, You still have to do what God wants. You still have to have the right heart, even when and and that shows the heart of a true Christian, doesn't it? How you react when injustice is done towards you. When good things are coming your way, no problem. Yes. We're gonna give you a big fat paycheck. Man, you'll take lots of abuse for money, won't you? Oh uh, yes. My boss is a jerk and he smells, but I'm going to be okay because he pays me a lot.
there are some things that you do just because you're a Christian. Priorities that we have. Then the Bible says in verse 9 that those that are masters, those who are slave rulers, that they should treat them with the same respect that they're getting back. Now I'm thinking, as I'm reading that, I'm going, okay, he told those who are being oppressed, here's what I want you to do. Here's how I want you to be. And then he begins to, which which seems outrageous, right? But then he tells the masters, I want you to do the same thing. Now you start thinking, what's he doing? He's building a relationship here. He's trying to get them to be able to work together for those who are under bondage to understand that there's still respect even to that man, even if they're not treating you properly, and those who are ruling, you have to learn that those who you rule over still deserve respect. That's important for us as leaders. That's important for us as pastors. That's important for us as fathers and mothers and parents. We show respect even when they treat us wrong. It's God and His Word that are my priority. As a ruler, I must respect those over whom I rule. These are the priorities that we have. So today, we've done a flyover. We talked about husbands and wives, children and parents, and for those that are in an oppressive situation. Can you say amen? Let's give Jesus a big hand clap. Can we do that? (laughs) If you've been blessed or challenged by today's preaching and you'd like to get in touch with us, the easiest way is via our website at www.newharvestuk.com. You can email us at info at newharvestuk.com or look us up on Facebook or Twitter. You can call us on 0161 278 6305 Or you can even write to us at 194 Chapel Street, Salford, Manchester, M36BY. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome for you to join us at any of our services. However you might be feeling, and whatever you might have been told, know this. God loves you, and there's a place for you in his kingdom. God bless you, we're praying for you, and once again, thank you for listening.